Um, so first of all, I need to apologize. The past few days, um, I've come down with a pretty bad head cold, so um, this might not be as spirited as I would like to have been. Um, but this is my last stop on a West Coast speaking tour, talking about, as Max said, um, deep green resistance. And this talk is mostly about um, reinforcing the need for resistance and the legitimacy of resistance. So um, at the end, I'll be talking about deep green resistance. And hopefully, as Max said, since we have some of the organizers here, um, we can break out into groups. So if any of you in the back can't hear me, just feel free to tell me and I'll speak up. Um, so. I don't remember exactly when I began feeling that there was something wrong with this culture we're living in and with the way that it's behaving towards the earth. Um, it probably started before I can remember when I was very young, but I do remember it becoming more and more obvious to me as I got older. I grew up in a rural part of western Washington in an area of occupied Chehalis land that's now called Grays Harbor County. And the house I grew up in was situated on this hillside that overlooked a large meadow which was home to many different creatures. I remember seeing deer, bobcats, coyotes, um, possums, eagles and hawks diving for snakes and field mice. And there was a herd of elk who would come through occasionally to graze and socialize. And I have vivid memories of an early fall morning going outside to do some chores. And since everything was covered in a thick fog, I couldn't see the elk who were over in the meadow when they began bugling to each other. Have any of you ever heard the bugling of elk? It's one of the most hauntingly beautiful noises I've ever heard, and I still get a chill sometimes when I think about that morning and their song coming to me through the fog. Um, another vivid memory I have is from summertime, falling asleep with my window open, listening to the equally haunting and equally beautiful noise of a pack of coyotes howling and barking in the forest. And when I think about the coyotes, I can't help but think about the frogs, who would almost drown out the howling of the coyotes with their own song which would be coming from the meadows, dusk turned to night. And so the first time I really remember this feeling that something just wasn't quite right um, was in my early teens when that meadow was put up for sale and sold to some people who were in the racing horse business. They brought in a home and turned the entire meadow into pasture for their racing horses. And after that, I no longer heard the bugling of elk and I didn't hear nearly as many frogs at night. I no longer saw bobcats or coyotes sneaking through the tall grass. And this feeling would become stronger whenever I would get in the car with my parents and we would drive somewhere and I'd see a new clear cut where there used to be a forest, a new shopping center where there used to be a meadow. I'd see creeks paved over and wild places developed into strip malls and parking lots. And so naturally during this time, there was a conflict that was born inside me. Although I couldn't articulate it at the time, I remember feeling very confused. What is this? What is going on? Why is the world being eaten by my own culture? Why is it that members of my own culture seem to think it's okay to just pave over a wetland or a forest in the homes of so many different creatures? Why is it that members of this culture seem to think it's okay, or that humans are exempt from the rule that everyone else follows, the rule that you have to give back to the land as much as you take from it, that you can't just keep taking and taking? And so I remember feeling all these things, even if I couldn't articulate them. And, but thanks to school, television, mainstream media, um, all of which implicitly told me that this is just normal. All this expansion is just the way life is. Um, that feeling was buried deep inside and almost forgotten. The, the voice of the culture was constantly reminding me that it's not the more than human world that is inherently good, but progress. Progress of human society is the highest goal one can aspire to. Progress is what we all should be moving towards. But then something happened my first quarter at college that brought that conflict to the surface of my thoughts. I was taking an intro to cultural anthrop anthropology class up in, uh, at Western Washington University in Bellingham. And um, we had gotten to the section in a textbook on food production. And when we got to the part on agriculture, I remember something that caught my eye in the top corner of one of the pages. It was a little yellow box, and all it said was, did you know that some revisionists think that agriculture was the worst mistake that humans ever made? Some revisionists think that agriculture was the worst mistake that humans ever made, and that is all it said. Nowhere else in the textbook could I find anything devoted to this startling idea. And so, while many of my peers were busy talking about how if we just could get a Democrat in the White House, things would be okay, <laughs> or while others were, were going deeper and looking at the economic system and talking about 
socialism, for example, as a way to make positive change. I found myself wanting to go deeper, as deep as the roots of civilization itself. Because nothing else really seemed as important to me as was making sure that these revisionists weren't actually right. Because if they were, that would mean that our entire civilization, which effectively began around 10,000 years ago with the advent of annual grain agriculture, was built on a mistake. And, you know, I think the reason this intrigued me so much at the time was simply because I already saw so much of this culture's behavior as exactly that, a mistake. Since I was young, I thought that expanding relentlessly into the natural world and into non-human communities was mistaken. Not only because it deprived innocent creatures of their homes, but also because I eventually felt it was silly that we had a growth-based society on a spherical planet that has obvious limits. I thought the worldview that allowed and encouraged this kind of continual expansion to happen was mistaken. During this time, though, I was also very aware, acutely aware, of the fact that I didn't know anyone else who was questioning the foundations of Western civilization. And there were more than a few times when I thought I was crazy for wanting to. That is, until I did find people who were questioning civilization. In fact, I found an entire tradition of people who could actually articulate and help me understand that feeling that I've been having in my bones for so long that something just wasn't right. People like Richard Manning, Daniel Quinn, Lear Keith, and others presented a more honest and common sense look at agriculture and the destructiveness that is inherent therein. And people like Jack Forbes, um, Derek Jensen, Susan Griffin, Chellis Glenn Dinning, um, David Abram, and many others um, presented a more honest and holistic look at the entire culture of civilization and its history of atrocities, colonialism, imperialism, enslavement, torture, rape, genocide, ecological devastation, and so on. These people helped me discover a path that made a hell of a lot of sense to me, m more sense than what I was learning in school. And they found the path that I wanted to follow. And that path has led me here tonight, speaking to you about how I think we've been led astray. So how many of you know who Rachel Carson was? Okay. And if you don't know, Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring which was published in 1962. And that book documented the nasty effects of chemical pesticides on the natural world and on humans. And it also exposed chemical industries for spreading disinformation to the public. And it's known today as the book that launched the modern environmental movement. And so an observation that we can make then is if the publishing of Silent Spring in 1962 was in fact the launching point of the modern environmental movement, that means we've had a modern environmental movement for about 50 years now. And so we've had half a century of modern environmentalism. And yet every living system on the planet is in decline. And the rate of decline is accelerating. There has not been one peer-reviewed scientific article that's been published in the past 30 years that shows any living system that is improving or even stable. Industrial society continues to eat into its ecological foundations, continually grinding away at the world of life. We all know what's happening. Every day, new forests are pulled down. Every day, new grassland and prairie land is ripped up. The average rate um, that we're driving species extinct is 50,000 a year. That's 140 every day. Um, mollusk populations are collapsing. Migratory songbird populations are collapsing. I heard scientists just the other week give um, coral reefs a few decades um, before they are extinct. And I, someone told me just today that the black rhino was now officially considered extinct down a few days ago or something. Um, and so, and I also have heard, I keep hearing climatologists talk about how they've yet again underestimated the speed and severity at which climate change is progressing. Um, one of the more conservative reports is now putting the average global temperature um, 11 degrees Fahrenheit warmer by the end of the century. And that now is, is, is definitely one of the more conservative reports. And the last time the Earth was that warm, there were alligators swimming in Hudson Bay. So the other day I ran into a former classmate of mine when I was walking through Western Washington University's campus. And he reminded me of something that one of our professors had said. She was a biologist, and she said, you know, sometimes as a biologist, I feel like all I'm doing in my career is cataloging collapse and documenting decline. And when he told me that, I was reminded also of 
um, something that the great Sierra Club conservationist David Brower said later in his life. Now, if you don't know David Brower, he started many environmental groups like Friends of the Earth, the Earth Island Institute, the League of Conservation Voters. Um, Earth First? <clears throat> I don't know about Earth First. I don't think so. Um, he might have had an inspirational role. Um, but he said later in his life, all I did in my career was slow the rate at which things are getting worse. All I did in my career was slow the rate at which things are getting worse. And so if we take a step back and look at the state of the earth, whether we're looking at the scientific data or the gaping wounds that we can see with our own eyes, the earth is not better off because of the so-called environmental movement. And I think that if we're going to move forward, we're going to have to admit to ourselves that for all practical purposes, environmentalism has failed. Um, but I'm here speaking to you because it's not too late. I don't believe it's too late for us to take effective action. My contention and the contention of the people I work with is that there is a way for us to stop the destruction of the planet. Um, and I want to talk about that in a little bit here. Right now, the environmental movement is simply making things less worse, here and there, as people continue to struggle holding on to the last remaining pockets of diversity that haven't yet fallen to the insatiable appetite of industrial society. It is primarily a defensive movement. All of its victories pretty much are temporary, in pockets, while the industrial capitalist economy is always on the offensive, taking and taking what it needs to function without giving anything back in return. And what it does give back is toxic. Plastic, styrofoam, synthetic chemicals, and so on. And so the question for me is, what is it going to take for us to actually make the world a better place, instead of just slowing the destruction? What is it going to take for us to turn the environmental movement into an offensive movement, instead of just a defensive one? And you know, whenever I ask myself that question, how are we going to make the world a better place, I usually find myself looking to those who I already know are making the world a better place. As I was writing up this speech, I remember looking out my window and seeing the branches of an alder tree reaching towards my house. And beyond that alder tree, there's some ocean spray. And beyond that, there's a dug fir. I know that they are all making the world a better place simply by doing what they do and being who they are. And I think back to the elk and the coyotes and the bobcats and the eagles and hawks that I grew up with. And I knew early on, even though I couldn't articulate that also, that they were making the world a better place simply by doing what they were doing and being who they were. And so there are forms of life all around us every day doing what this culture cannot do and its members. They're making the world a better place because of their existence. And my point with saying this is that whatever movement we build, whatever struggle we create, it has got to be in accord with the more than human world. Whatever we create has to conform to the needs of the land and not the other way around. And that is what is so frustrating to me about the mainstream environmental movement. Pretty much every solution that I've seen that's been proposed to confront climate change or the general ecological crises, all of them seem, seem to be trying to force the earth into some sort of compromise so that the industrial economy can still be existing alongside it. You know, solar panels, a single solar cell still requires an industrial infrastructure to exist. I know many of you know this. And you still need rare, you still need rare earth mining, mining to get the rare earth minerals like cadmium, tellurium. Um, you need and you need the entire infrastructures that make the production, manufacturing, and distribution possible. Not to mention the social inequalities that this system keeps in place and that I don't hear a lot of people talking about. Who's going to be mining that metal? Is it still going to be poor brown people in a third world country? Is it going to be, are we going to have to keep flattening ecosystems to get at the necessary materials? And the same goes for wind energy. How are we going to get all the metal it takes to build giant farms of these, of these windmills? Um, What's going, to t what's going to power the factories that make the ball bearings that go into every turbine? Or these things use oil for lubrication. Where are we going to get that oil? And that isn't even to mention the migratory birds and the bats that these things kill every day. The reason the earth is being destroyed is not because the industrial capitalist economy isn't green enough. It's not because we haven't yet adopted clean energy. The transition to so-called clean energy and renewables it doesn't challenge the system of extraction. It doesn't challenge imperialism or stealing resources from the colonized countries. In a green economy, whatever that means, the rich continue to get richer with new marketing schemes and the world continues to be destroyed. We've already seen it happening. 
And as long as we don't challenge the foundations of this system, um, it's going to continue operating in the same old destructive way and eating the earth, whether it's green or not. And this is one of the main things that I wanted to talk to you about tonight, that we live in an economy that is inherently earth destroying. We are nowhere near a different way of life. And I want to share something that really helped me understand this. And that was learning about the work of an anthropologist by the name of Ruth Benedict. Um, Ruth Benedict was doing some cross-cultural work in the early 1900s. And she figured out that the fundamental difference between aggressive cultures and non-aggressive cultures came down to their social reward system. Um, non-aggressive cultures had social forms that rewarded behavior that benefited the group as a whole and kept any wealth that there was spread out among all members. Whereas the aggressive cultures had social forms that rewarded behavior that benefited the individual at the expense of the group as a whole. And so the non-aggressive cultures used what Benedict called a siphon system, where wealth is constantly siphoned from rich to poor. And these kinds of cultures are often characterized by security for obvious reasons. People aren't trying to hoard wealth. They're not trying to make it to the top in some dog-eat-dog -dog world. Cooperation is primary. And the aggressive cultures, on the other hand, use what Benedict called a funnel system, where wealth is constantly funneled from poor to rich. And these kinds of cultures are often characterized by insecurity because people are competing with one another to make it to positions of prestige and power. And they have to step on each other's backs to get there. And so, when I learned about this, I immediately asked myself, what are we? What is this culture? Um, and I think as we continue to see the gap between wealthy and poor continue to grow, and when the average CEO is making $12,000 an hour, I think it's safe to say that we live in the largest funnel system ever to exist. We, put, we actually are forced to put responsibility for our very communities into the hands of distant people whose job is not to make sure that our communities are healthy and functioning nor is it to make sure that our communities are in right relationship with the Earth. Their job is to make sure the economy is healthy and functioning, the funnel economy that brings them their wealth, the funnel <coughs> economy that gives them the full power of the state and legions of police to protect <coughs> them from people who might not like this particular arrangement of power, the funnel economy that keeps them, that protects them from being held accountable for their crimes against the Earth. If it had been any one of us in this room who spilled 39 million gallons of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. What do you think would have happened to us? Well, the CEO of BP, Tony Hayward, uh, lost his job, but received a $1.6 million severance package and a sizable annual pension. And you know, this shouldn't surprise us because this is what happens in a funnel system. The few people who benefit from funnel system economics are also the ones who have the power to act with impunity because they have the power to silence dissent and keep people from holding them accountable. And so the other main thing I want to get across tonight is that this is only one aspect of the problems we're facing. Um, it's not just that we live in a fundamentally screwed up economy. Because a social system, a social reward system that funnels wealth from poor to rich can only get so far by itself. There is something deeper, much more fundamental, that gives people, that gives that system its power, that gives people the very ability to clear cut a forest, or to suck the life out of the oceans, or to blow the top of a mountain. And what I've learned is that we will behave in the world largely based on the stories that we are given about it. Because humans are storytelling creatures. Before we can have, um, before we can destroy the earth, we have to have earth-destroying stories. We have to have stories telling us, whether it's implicit or explicit, that forests are there for us to cut down, that mountaintops are there for us to blow off, and that oceans are there for us to vacuum. We have to have stories telling us that it's okay to torn humans to further the causes of science and medicine. And you know, these are exactly the kind of stories we've been given. Narcissistic stories telling us that the world was put here for our use and that we have the right to take whatever we want from the natural world and not humans. Arrogant stories telling us that we can control and manipulate nature without seriously messing things up. And patriarchal stories telling men that their imperative as men is to dominate their world and violate. Um, not all cultures have had these kinds of stories. And consequently, not all cultures have destroyed their land base. Not all cultures have had rates of child abuse and rape that come anywhere close to this culture. There have existed cultures, and there still exist cultures, that know nothing of debt, or bombs, prisons, poverty, homelessness, junk food even. Um, 
humans have the capacity to live with each other and with the land in harmonious ways, in beautiful ways, if they have a culture that nurtures harmony and beauty instead of aggression and domination. And so if you have an economic system that's funneling wealth from poor to rich, what is that wealth? What's it made out of? And this is where those stories come in, because how much easier it is for wealth to flow into the pockets of the powerful if a mountain, for example, is just a pile of rock that you can blow the top off of, extract the bauxite, smelt that into aluminum, and turn that into beer cans, or blue sky natural soda cans, if you prefer, <laughs> and then sell those as a commodity. How much easier it is to have this kind of economy when the world is just a bunch of dead objects that don't have any value until you turn them into something that can be bought and sold. If this culture actually valued relationship with the world instead of power over it and control of it, if this culture actually valued and respected the life in a forest, the life in a mountain, or the life in the oceans and rivers, it could not justify the existence of the extractive economy. If the plants and other animals were not just things that existed for our use, or if they weren't just scenery, or the pleasant backdrop to our more pressing human concerns, I don't think we could justify clear-cutting, or building cell phone towers, or animal testing. Before we can have any of those things, we have to have those stories that silence the more than human and tell us implicitly or explicitly that the human world is the most important world. Um, and so, once you've done that, once you've, one way I like to put it is cut the vocal cords of another group that you need to exploit, you can justify pretty much anything, whether it's apartheid, the Holocaust, or continental deforestation. <coughs> And the other side of this coin is that because this culture does value power over things instead of relationship with them, you know, most of us aren't brought up being trained to listen to the earth. Instead of being brought up able to hear the songs of plants or to detect the mood in the landscape, um, most of us now are, are tuned more to the frequency of our machines, to the sounds of this city or the sounds of our cell phones. Instead of being able to navigate a forest or the open ocean with nothing but our wits and our senses, we are more comfortable navigating our keyboards in the abyss of the internet. Um, as the natural world is dumbed down, if you will, with chainsaws and bulldozers, I believe that our imaginations are dumbed down as well. And our very human capacity for living on this earth is dumbed down as well. Um, and so, the reason I've chosen to talk to you tonight about funnel system economics, anthropocentric cultural stories, and the interlocking relationship between those two things is hopefully to reinforce the idea that it is not a quick fix that we can rely on that's going to solve our problems. Because these problems are fundamental and deeply, deeply entrenched. And if we're going to go back to that question about making the world a better place, if we are going to make the world a better place because we were born, then I think we're going to have to start doing a hell of a lot more than we've been doing for the past 50 years. Um, now, there is already a lot of work being done by people who recognize the insanity of this system. A lot of people are doing the very important work of coming up with alternatives. I'm talking about the transition town movement, permaculture, um, people working on eco-villages, people working towards localized food systems, medicine, uh, housing, things like that. And like I said, this work is extremely important, dreadfully important. And Max and I have been involved in some of it off and on for the past few years. But by itself, it's not enough. My position on building alternatives is that it must be linked to some larger political struggle that's actually going to confront the system that's destroying the planet. You know, I hear a lot of people, especially people in the transition town movement, talk about something called resilience. Building communities that are resilient enough to withstand peak oil or economic collapse. But what I don't often hear them talking about is how these theoretical communities are going to be resilient if, for example, there are no more salmon left in the rivers. If you're trying to build a resilient community without confronting and dismantling the system that is sucking the life out of the land all around you, I think becoming resilient will be a challenging thing. Um, if your alternative culture isn't um, relying on withdrawal without including the possibility, let alone the necessity, of supporting those who would fight back is, I think, a sorry alternative for active political engagement. Um, which is what I want to talk about now. Now when I say political engagement, I'm not necessarily referring to getting involved in mainstream politics. 
I'm not necessarily talking about getting involved in the bipartisan debate, although that might be a small part of what we can do, especially on a local level. Um, what it means to be political goes way beyond Republicans and Democrats, way beyond the two-sided capitalist party system. What it means to be political simply means to be um, involved in how humans are living on this earth. It means to be involved in how decisions are being made and what kinds of decisions are being made. But, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who still buy into the delusion that those in power have a monopoly on politics. And those people still think or still see the legislative bureaucracy or the mainstream political structure as the only legitimate ways to make meaningful change. Signing petitions, going to court, uh, getting permits for demonstrations, voting, things like that. I think that we need to realize that, and I'm sure many of you already do, that these methods of political engagement are the methods that those in power allow. And they allow them because they by themselves do not challenge the fundamental flow of power. They don't challenge funnel system economics. And so I don't think at this point we can afford to allow those in power to predetermine the ways in which we oppose them any longer. And I think this is a good time to bring up something Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, we should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. When we live under a system of law that defines everything non-human in this world as property, instead of as family, or the very least community, I do not hesitate to say that that system of law is unjust, and that we should not base our actions on whether or not they conform to a legal system that is so blatantly out of touch with the world. Um, <clears throat> if the law is not going to do the right thing, which I don't believe it ever will, as long as the earth is just a piece of property, then it's going to have to be us who do the right thing. And so really, when I say political engagement, I mean political struggle. I mean building a political movement that will actually deprive the rich of their ability to steal from the poor and deprive the powerful of their ability to destroy the planet. <coughs> Negotiation is out of the question, because if you're like me, you do not share fundamental values with the powers of civilization. In fact, if you're like me, your values are fundamentally opposed to the very structure of civilization. You cannot negotiate with those in power when the systems they control and the institutions they run are built on those funnel system sociopathic values that I was talking about earlier, when the entire system they run is based on the accumulation and maintenance of wealth and power. And you know, the window of time in which asking nicely for change has long since passed. I might be talking about asking nicely or making deals if there were still giant flocks of passenger pigeons on the East Coast, or if there were still 70 million bison roaming the plains, or if there were even larger herds of pronghorn antelope roaming this region. Um, or if the rivers here were still full of salmon, if there was still old growth forest, if there were still prairies, tall grass prairies, if there were still Columbia Basin pygmy rabbits, or Bachman's warblers, or heath hens. Um, maybe I'd be talking about negotiation if this culture hadn't already proven itself to be a culture of genocide, colonizing, dispossessing, or exterminating any indigenous culture that it comes into contact with. Right now, we are on stolen land. We are on occupied land. I believe it's Ohlone land. Um, and until we plan for and help indigenous people reclaim their homelands, we are complicit in an ongoing genocide. And as I speak, the last remaining groups of truly free human beings are under assault by this continual expansion. And I'm talking about the Arhuaco, who live in the Sierra Nevada of northern Colombia, or the Yanomami, and the Inawaninawe, who live in the Brazilian Amazon, or the Dongri Akan, who live in the mountains of India, just to name a few. Um, if, to me, resistance is our only option at this point, because the world is being ripped apart, the earth is being ripped apart, and we have to fight. When he was on trial for his crimes against the apartheid regime in South Africa, Nelson Mandela said, I do not deny that I plan sabotage. I did not plan it in a spirit of recklessness, nor because I have any love of violence. I planned it as a result of a calm and sober assessment of the political situation that had arisen after many years of tyranny, exploitation, and oppression of my people by the whites. Those of us who are making the call for resistance are not doing so out of a reactionary fever. We are doing so because of a calm, and, in part, because of a calm and sober assessment of the history of civilization 
and the tyranny, oppression, and exploitation that it has wrought upon the earth and its people for the past 10,000 years. But we're also doing so because of a swelling rage that grows with every species gone extinct, every toxic gift this culture gives to the earth, every day that brings us closer to catastrophic climate change. Our rage is growing. And this leads to what I really wanted to get to tonight, which was Deep Green Resistance, a movement I think is long overdue. Now, Deep Green Resistance is a movement that's taking its first steps with an analysis that starts off where modern environmentalism leaves off. Industrial civilization is incompatible with life. Technology can't fix it, and shopping, no matter how green, won't stop it. Those of us in the Deep Green Resistance Movement believe that the only path forward at this point is to build a serious resistance movement that has the capacity to bring down the industrial economy. And so our strategy involves two separate parts of a movement, an above ground and an underground. Deep Green Resistance is the above ground, and therefore our work is strictly limited to nonviolence. As the above ground, we have two roles. One, we help build a strong, effective movement using civil disobedience to stop the destruction of the planet as much as possible. And two, through the use of education and media, we promote the necessity of a militant underground that would dismantle infrastructure, which would buy time for those of us in the above ground to save what can be saved. Now, resistance movements throughout history have had underground wings that dismantle the infrastructure of oppressive regimes. And they've done that because it works. So our message for those who are able and willing, whatever underground organization is created, it will need to have the training, the discipline, the strategic savvy to coordinate decisive actions on a continental scale. And there are manuals written with our tax dollars that can tell us how. If we are to succeed with this in the time frame we have, we're going to need it all. Our movements have to work in tandem, the above ground and the underground, the militants and the nonviolent, the frontline activists and the cultural workers. We need them all. And this brings to mind the abolitionist movement and the way pacifist Quakers opened their homes to armed abolitionists who were freeing slaves. Um, that kind of feeling. Because Deep Green Resistance is above ground, we have no connection to any underground activities and we don't want any. Our job is to promote the idea that the underground is needed. And so what we actually do, our day-to-day -day work as an organization, is strictly nonviolent. But the tactics of this above ground work will have to do much more in order to be successful. And that is our message to those of you, to those of us, who feel that they are, are more suited for this above ground work. We're going to need a nonviolence the likes of which this country hasn't seen since the civil rights movement. A nonviolence full of courage and love. When we do civil disobedience actions, we're going to have to do them at key points of industry and make sure that those campaigns are sustained. We're going to have to put our bodies between what is left of this planet and fossil fuel. And this means we do a campaign and we don't go home until it's done. This means clogging the jails, not for one day, but for days, weeks, and even months. This means jail solidarity. This means making sacrifices and risking severe consequences to push this movement forward. And most of all, this means commitment. We need people willing to dedicate their lives to this. Nonviolence now does not make us safe in our confrontations with power. So we'll also need to build strong community and support for each other, legal defense funds, and support for the families of those who are imprisoned for long sentences or who lose their jobs because of their service to the movement. This means creating support networks for food, money, transportation, child care, medical care, and simple companionship. Really, we need people willing to dedicate themselves to being the material support for frontline activists. The above ground part of this movement is also tasked with figuring out what's going to come during and after collapse. While the primary focus is resistance, we still need people working in the transition town movement and working on permaculture, and we still need people doing anti-racism and anti-sexism work. Through collapse, we're going to need to have cultural workers creating ways to deal with violence when it occurs and with sociopaths who might try to seize power for themselves. And something I will mention again is that we must plan for indigenous people's reclamation of their homelands. Now, with all this said, those of us in DGR believe that if civilization is dismantled, there will be an opportunity for people to create thousands of autonomous cultures nestled inside repaired and restored land bases, relearning the way of life that humans have known for 99% of our existence on this planet, more than 99%. But resistance, resistance is primary. Without resistance, we won't have any land base to repair and restore. We won't have any perennial gardens to nourish us. The longer the system is allowed to continue, the less life will be able to survive a collapse. Our first goal has to be protecting the land that gives us our life. And that means nothing short of removing this crust 
this crust of civilization so that the land can begin to heal. Life is tenacious and life wants to live, but it needs our help getting the boot of civilization off its neck. And so a question to end this talk tonight is, are we ready to be responsible? Are we ready to be responsible to the land and to the other forms of life who we share this planet with? If I'm honest when I say that I love this life, and if I'm honest when I say that I love the elk and the coyotes and the bobcats and the songs that they sing, and if I understand that love is not just something you say, but something you do, then all I can honestly do and truly feel responsible to the earth and to the land is to, build and help, is to help build a resistance movement with the capacity to bring down this insane culture. And so my plea to you is that even if you have a weary heart, that you let love guide you. And I ask you to consider what it is in this world that you do love and what you're willing to do to defend it. Thank you very much.